Hey guys, welcome to our Google Hangout interview with Syria Deeply and Joshua Land is a professor at the University of Oklahoma and the author of Syria Comment, one of the most powerful and insightful voices on the web on Syria, even before the uprising. Uh, professor Landis, we are so grateful to have you with us doing your first Google Hangout. Thank you for being here. Well, it's very exciting and it's exciting to be with you because Syria Deeply is just looks spectacular and uh, we're, we're, we're praying for great things here. That means the world to us. Uh, Professor Landis, we've read your writings, we've interviewed you often, and at this extremely critical moment where everybody says these may be the end days of the Assad regime, what is your take? Is that what we're seeing here? You know, frankly, I don't think we're seeing the end days. Uh, obviously, uh, things have become much more dire for the regime. It's lost, uh, largely lost Aleppo in the north of the country. It's lost the east of the country. But it's still holds vast amounts of the country. It has a military that is the strongest single militia, if you will, in Syria. It's got extraordinary weapons, still an air force, which the, the rebels do not have, and it's got a lot of backers, Russia, Iran, Hezbollah, that are in the neighborhood that are committed to seeing it survive. And, uh, and it has, most importantly, this small ethnic group or sectarian group, the Alawites, who are about 2.5 million people and are highly trained in the military and are uh, believe that they could see that they could be slaughtered if they just lay down their guns. And just today, in fact, I posted a video of several Alawite officers having their heads chopped off yeah. and the rebels held out their heads like Medusa in front of the camera with the blood gushing out of their necks. So th those sorts of things, I don't think, make the Alawites sleep very comfortably at night. And obviously, they're going to fight like the Dickens in order to hold on to what they have. So that's why those are the main reasons why I think that we haven't seen the end of this yet. So let's zoom in even further into trying to understand the Alawite community. They are an offshoot of Shiite Islam. You said 2.5 million out of a total of about 20 million people in Syria. How do they see Assad, and why are they so loyal to a man even after he's done everything he's done in the past 20 months? Well, Assad convinced them uh, that if they don't fight, that they're going to be facing Islamic extremists. And that was certainly not the case when this started two years ago. But increasingly, it's becoming the case. And uh, the ethnic, the sectarian, anger and hatred even has, uh, you know, mounted and has become rife everywhere in Syria. And so this, this prophecy has become self-fulfilling to a certain extent. And I think there is this deep sense of dread in the Alawite community that should they lay down their arms, there could be real serious uh, bloodletting. And that's, that's, what, that's what keeps them rallied around because they're, they're worried that if they divide and splinter, they would collapse and they would become defenseless. Now, that's the kind of macro sense here that the Alawites are just so afraid of the alternative that they're willing to fight to the death for Assad himself. Now, when you look at the core structure of power players still running the show, intelligence, security, is it really just Alawites? Are there still non-Alawites who back Assad? Or is this really coming down to his clan and his family? Well, I think it will come down to his family and his clan, but it isn't there yet. We've been watching since the beginning of this revolution the, the slow collapse of Syria into these sectarian parts, into class parts, into regional parts, but very important, of course, is the sectarian parts. And, and the Ba'ath Party was a, an alliance of many different peoples, not only the Alawites, but of course the Christians and Druze, the other minorities who have stuck with Assad more or less uh, but the Sunnis have been falling away, and we've seen massive defections, and certainly internal defections. I mean, people spiritually, the Sunnis, I think, have abandoned this regime largely. But many of them are still there, and they're still fighting in that army, even if half-heartedly. And you take Damascus. Damascus is a Sunni city, and yet it has been, at least in the core, where the upper classes and middle classes are, it is still quiet, relatively, and perhaps even many supporters of Assad, because they look at Aleppo 
and it, they're filled with horror and dread. They do not want their homes to be destroyed. They don't want their businesses to be destroyed. And the government is still paying salaries. The government is paying retirement. The, the government, there are still schools open and, and things like that in Damascus. That's not the case in Aleppo. The rebels have zero capability of providing any of these things that a normal state would provide. So you're just jumping off the cliff, in a sense, to support the rebels today. And that's that's the fault, in part, of course, of Assad, who has, who has really destroyed the opposition and fragmented them. But it's also the point of the part of the opposition that have not done their, that have not provided an alternative that, that is really appealing. That makes sense. But in a, you know, we think of all the scenarios that people toss around, like, will there be a split in Syria? Will it be two countries, a little Alawite statelet? Uh, will is that really kind of how this plays out when you game it out in your mind? I mean, is that when I really game it out? If I can game it out for you, here's the yeah. way I do it. There are three regional um, models that Syria could follow: a Turkish model, Iraq model, and a Lebanon model. Because all of them have gone through revolutions and civil wars, if you will. And Turkey went through its, from 1914 to 1922, there were almost 20%, 18% Christians in Anatolia in 1914. By the time 1922 finished and Ataturk consolidated his power, there were less than 1%. Now you're a Satrakian, I, I'm assuming you're from Armenian descent, so you know all about this. I'm actually from Gaziantep, and I'm going there later this week. Oh, well, there you go. And, uh, and so Turkey, in a sense, solved it's nation building problems by ethnically cleansing, killing Armenians and clearing out the Christians, the Greek Orthodox, after the Greeks invaded. This, in a sense, solved the national problem. I mean, not advocating ethnic cleansing, but the democratic transition that Erdogan has taken Turkey through in the last decade has been accomplished in part because there were no Christians. If there had been a 20% voting block of Christians in Anatolia today, they would have voted for the Kamalists. They would have voted for the generals. They would have been in for military dictatorship. And they would have thought that Erdogan was Ayatollah Khomeini coming to spread Islamism. Much like the Christians and Alawites of Syria, who have stopped this revolution in its tracks and have fought so bitterly and, have, and are turning Syria into a failed state. So you touch on something so fascinating, which is the role of minority rights in not just constructing a state, but getting to the point of a state. So well, you have they have to be working. You know, obviously Turkey accused the Armenians of siding with Russia during the First World War and of being a fifth column. And the Turks accused the Greek Orthodox of siding with the Greeks who invaded Anatolia uh, at the end of World War I. And so they accused these people of being traitors, and they killed them or they pushed them out. And, uh, and in a sense, they still have to contend with Kurds, which is the big unanswered ethnic problem in Turkey, and it's, and it's what kept Turkey out of the EU in part, and it's, and it's bedeviling Turkish real transformation, real democratic transformation. And, and, but Turkey has these problems, but Syria has them in spades, and so does, so does Iraq and Lebanon, this whole multi-ethnic sort of arc over the Levant which was like the Austro-Hungarian Empire after the First World War, which was also the site of tremendous ethnic cleansing, the Balkans. This is what we're seeing taking place as nation building. And, and in a sense, Syria is choking on its minorities right now who've, who were empowered by the French, who've had their foot on the necks of the Sunni majority for the last 50 years under the Ba'ath Party. And the Sunnis are trying to throw it off. And it could lead to the Turkish model, which is ethnic cleansing, which is one way to solve a national problem. Now, I don't think that's going to happen because Turkey had a very powerful leader in Ataturk and a very unified nationalist movement under him coming out of the First World War. He was a George Washington of Turkey. Syria has nothing like that. It doesn't have a national leader. It has a very fragmented movement. So they can't replicate that. They don't have the power, I don't think. And of course, the Alawites are extremely frightened to give them the power because they don't want to end up like the Armenians. That's an There's the Iraq model. 
Okay, but let's just play that one out in serious terms. So, in a sense, you have, you, I mean, I would hesitate to ever call a minority a problem, but you have a minority issue in Syria. How are you going to get, if say that's the case and from, from now, how do you get from a, a situation where Alawites pretty much run the show to where it's either Sunnis run the show or just more pluralistic and more democratic? With, what do you do? How do you, how do you handle them in your midst? Is it just going to be bloody warfare until they figure out where the balance lies? Well, you know, then there's the Iraq model. And most people thought that Syria would play out like the Iraq model because that's what they just seen, which right. is the majority population in Iraq, it was the Shiite, 60%, throw out the minority, the Sunnis, 20% that have been ruling Iraq since the First World War, and uh, that they just take over. The, the Sunnis are cast down to the bottom of society, the Shiites come to the top, and you get a new central government made up of the majority, and uh, you just have to basically pound the minority into submission. Now do that you happened in Iraq. Likely? Yeah, short, oh, short, of an, uh, short of the other parallels, but do you think that's the more likely scenario for Syria? Well, it hasn't worked out that way, and in large part, it hasn't worked out that way because there's no boots on the ground. The American army made that happen in Iraq. First of all, by de destroying Saddam Hussein's state, so thoroughly deep application, and then going after al-Qaeda and all the Sunni militias that, that opposed it and smashing them. But it also did another important thing, which is to keep its foot on top of the Southernist movement, Skiri, all the other Shiite contenders for power. Right. It helped Maliki emerge as the winner. It picked the winner, Maliki, made him, and it destroyed his opponents, or at least kept their, his foot on their, his opponents until he could consolidate an army and a central state, just enough so that they could get the hell out of there. And it took him eight years. So this was not an easy process. It cost a trillion dollars. It's not going to happen in Syria. So you're not going to have, I mean, they're not really related, but the Ba'ath Party in Iraq and the Ba'ath Party in Syria don't have the same fate. You're not going to have it kind of taken out in Syria the way it was taken out in Iraq. So well, I think eventually it will be taken out. But, but I don't the think whole it's state apparatus, happen. the army, the everything, just like... Well, you know, uh, we don't know yet. And I'm just saying that you could have the Iraq model. That's what everybody thought would happen. But, of course, the missing, the missing element is a U.S. army. So it's unlikely to evolve in that way because you don't have an army to build a central state. What you've got is a lot of militias contending for power, which leaves you with a Lebanon model, which yeah. is long, protracted civil war with different militias right. fighting it out. And that's what you see most likely? Well, I don't think it will mirror Lebanon exactly because Lebanon is a third, third, third. Lebanon is ethnically balanced in a sense by having Shiites, Maronites, Christians, or Christians, Shiites, Christians, and Sunnis, each owning a third of the population. And none of them could rule over each other. And they discovered this after 15 years of trying to smash each other. And of course, a lot of outside penetration, stopping any one winner. And, uh, but they ultimately, the, the different warlords, like, uh, you know, like Jaja, for the right. Maronites or, or uh, Jean Blot for the Druze. You can basically Hassan take any current political leader in it. <laughs> they all, all these major warlords who, who were responsible, most of whom were responsible for the death of 20, 30,000 Lebanese during the Civil War, all kissed and made up. And now they are in Parliament together and they pretend to enjoy each other's company or at least put up with it. And you have rather dysfunctional Lebanese state that hasn't solved their problem but they live with each other uh, and and you have a dysfunctional state and that's the that's the tie accord which divides up power according to each minority group or each confession and doles out government positions scrupulously right and to, for those who don't understand Lebanese politics is split between Sunni Shiite and Christians and each community gets a certain number of seats in parliament, and seats in power, etc. And that's been right. tossed around already as a potential model for Syria. But it well, also that you had America to wanted to use it as a model for Iraq, but right. it's so dysfunctional. I don't know why anybody would wish it on anybody. Right. And Syrians have always demonized the Lebanese model because they they manipulated it for so long that they they learned to condescend and look down at Lebanese. Okay, so you've given us three potential kind of case studies for Syria: Iraq, Turkey, and Lebanon. Is there another? 
more Syrian outcome that we could see? And I still want to get at what you think is probably going to happen, not, you know, wh where's all this pointing to? Well, here's, here's you know, th there's so many unknowns, but I don't think that Assad can rule over Damascus and the Sunni population of Syria forever. I think it'll take a long time for it to be completely undermined. Months? But I do believe it. Weeks, months? Oh, months. I, you know, everybody's saying by summertime he's going to be gone. I don't believe that. I mean, it's possible because the opposition has been making headway every month. You know, you take any month, it's made a serious headway. But Damascus is a big city. It's going to be destroyed before Assad relinquishes it. And that, that's going to take a long time. He uh, has and said, most, yeah. And so many people in Damascus are terrified of the opposition today because the opposition has become more brutal and more unappealing with every month in some ways. It's become more powerful. But and, um, So what do you think of Assad himself? He said he's going to die in Syria. He won't let go. Sure. Do you think that's the case? Could he yes. go somewhere? Well, how does that work? He's just going to stay there till someone takes him out until he loses the fight? Well, you know, the best case scenario for him, should he lose Damascus, of course he hasn't he hasn't reconciled himself to the notion that he's going to lose Damascus. But, but if he does, he's going to have to, he's got a community of 2.5 million Alawites who are in depending on him. On the coast. In on the coast. They live in a coastal region, the coastal mountains, what are called traditionally the Alawite Mountains or the Nusayati Mountains. And they don't dominate the cities. The cities on, you know, Latakia, Be Benyas, uh, Tartus, Jebele, along the coast are majority Sunni, but they're big Christian and Alawite particularly communities. So they're shared cities, but the mountains themselves are vast, you know, overwhelmingly Alawite. And that's where the Alawites are going to end up, because they're just going to be driven back. And once they're there, they're defending their families. And every one of these officers and generals and soldiers has a family in a village that he's going to defend tooth and nail. Because so uh, should, Asad goes uphill, in a sense? He flee. goes uphill as he goes downhill. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, that's good, because you think about a guy like that, he has small kids. He has a wife. He, he has a wife, he has kids, and he's got tons of cousins, all of whom are going to be killed the moment he lays down his arms. And or it's not him. flies could, to Venezuela. He and could run away. No way. And go to Russia or something like that. But his entire village is going to be, is going to be decimated. Nobody, there's nothing going to be left alive in, 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 uh, in Kordaha the moment he lays down his guns. And that's the problem. So he's not going to lay down his guns. He's telling his people, I'm not going to forsake you. They're counting on his military, which is increasingly becoming an Alawite militia, to back up to the mountains and save them. Because they don't want to have happen to them what happened to those Alawite generals in, in humps who had their heads chopped off. So when that's you think, what, right, I mean, this, that's what awaits them. this comes up again and again when people think about how do you convince the Alawites or bring them on board or make them comfortable. So They're not going to be comfortable. There's nobody who's going to guarantee can, their comfort. Can someone go in and offer to protect them? Can someone? What, the U.S. Can, Army? I don't know. nice to volunteer the U.S. Army, but it's not, not we know. I, I, I would doubt know it would be, there's... but I mean, shouldn't there be some sort of way to step in and tell that community? Otherwise, we're just going to watch this all play out the way you yes. describe. Well, so how, how do you to. stop it? Well, look at the American army was in Iraq, and the Christian population of Iraq, which was three or four percent of the country, was decimated. Be and the American army was there, over 100,000 soldiers, and they couldn't do anything about it because these people are weak. They have money. Once they lay down their arms, they're weak. The Christians didn't have any arms in Iraq, and they had money. And it's already happening in Syria. You know, four of my Christian friends in Syria have had family members kidnapped. And, um, and they paid through the nose to get them out again. And, and they all left as soon as it happened. And, and other Christians began to leave because they know everybody's hungry. People are starving to death. And anybody with a gun is going to walk into a Christian apartment and say, I'll kill you or give me $20,000. And that's exactly what's happening right now. And what about the Alawites? How is there some way to stop everyone from just going at each other and retreating? Do you create an Alawite state? Lit. State you lit. Can't, you can't create an Alawite state today. Uh, nobody would recognize it. Not America, not Europe. 
uh, they're committed to a unified Syria. At least that's what they say they are. Now that could change, but it'd be very difficult because the coastline of Syria, the Alawite region, is plum territory. Right. That's the sea line. It's a coastline. It's so valuable to Syria. No Syrian Sunni Arab from the hinterland is going to want to see that lopped off of Syria. It'd be like the Golan Heights. Uh, or And the, the Kurds, of course, are going to want the Northeast. So there is a potential, you know, fragmentation of Syria uh, and what Syrians call the Sykes-Picot II in reference to the First World War divide right. up of the whole greater Syria by France and Britain. But right. They have, you know, this is an allergic reaction when you mention things like this to Syrians. It wow. could happen, but no country is going to recognize it. Why does it just seem so practical then? Because, in a sense, we just look at this as Americans and say, okay, if they can't get along, just separate them. So you can't well, separate them. You can't stop them from fighting. So we're just going to watch the Syrian bloodletting, no matter, even if there is a transition. Nothing, nothing we've heard so far about a transition ha ha has a plan in place to solve this issue and to well, keep them from, from you know, fighting endlessly. The comparison this raises, of course, Yugoslavia. And ultimately, Yugoslavia was solved or settled, at least for now, by dividing it up into these cantons with different religious groups in each little country. And, but that happened only after years of bloodletting and big massacres in order to sort out the population. Now, of course, that happened throughout Eastern Europe in Czechoslovakia at the end of World War II, Czechoslovakia kicked out their entire German community, as well as some other people. Um, and, yeah. and America accepted it at the time. Right. But that could happen if, if the problem with the coast is that you've got all these Sydney cities, right. which run down it. And do those cities agree to live in an Alawite state? Do they fight? Are any of the rebel militias going to try to take them? They're going to certainly try. Right. You can't so stop them. So looking at the opposition now, we're about to, literally about to go to Marrakesh to cover the, the Friends of Syria meeting. When you look at that coalition, do you have faith that they can pull this all together, that they can pull through it to any kind of peaceful re resolution, or do you not think that these are the guys who do the job? Look, these guys who are meeting in Morocco, uh, I mean, it, who America has backed this national coalition and is likely to recognize in the coming week or two, Maybe that'll be the outcome of a Morocco thing. I'm not sure. They are the most pro-American, well-educated, elite Syrians you can find. Now, they're heavily weighted towards the Muslim Brotherhood, which America didn't want to see taking the civilian leadership. But I think as this progresses and the, the, the Salafism becomes the sort of default mode in Syria, America is going to learn to love the Muslim Brotherhood as they are in Tunisia and other places, they're going to see it as, a, as the best case scenario and the savior because it's a big party and it could help hopefully stabilize and unify the Sunni Arabs. But that's getting ahead of myself. The point is that these, people, these civilians now are upper class elite civilians who've been in exile. They are far, far removed socially and ideologically from the warriors on the ground who have the real power and have the guns. And are going to solve or are going to settle this problem inside Syria. Settle is a good word. Solve. And America is terrified of those militia leaders right now because yeah. they see them becoming more Islamist and more brutal. And America is trying to glue some kind of civilian leadership on top of this military effort that will be pro-American, not anti-Israel, and that will be human rights observers that they can send money to, who, which Congress and the American people won't be horrified by. And that's what they're trying to do, is glue on this sort of face of civilization on top of what looks like a very Hobbesian world out there in Syria. Wow. Not very they succeed? I don't know. What's the best case scenario for Syria? The best case scenario is that the Sunni Arab majority that make up 70% of the Syrian population. As Assad is pushed out of Damascus, finds its common cultural impetus and unit begins the to- The Syrian vibe. The Take Syrian it. nationalist vibe. And uh, you know, Syrians always will tell you, oh, we're not extremists. 
we are merchant people. We have this very, you know, live and let live culture. We've all gotten along in the Syrian mosaic. All of those, you know, default modes that have been very important to Syria throughout history. And Syria has not had a civil war in its past that we can remember. There was some bloodletting here and there in the 1860s and so forth. But essentially, Syria has been uh, a functioning society that hasn't really gone after each other. This is new. Of course, it's not new to the Levant, but it's new for Syria. And the hope is, is that that Sunni majority will find common ground, come together, and provide, you know, there's extraordinary creativity amongst the Sydney expats and Sydney's people are coming up with new ideas for 40 years. They haven't been able to think. They've been slaves to this very oppressive government. And uh, the, the, the amount of creativity and new thinking in civil society that could blossom if the military situation settles down uh, is, is what gives us hope. A chance for Syria to shine. Yes. Joshua Landis, thank you so much for joining us. Super grateful for your time. And now that you've done your first Google Hangout, we hope to have you on. Okay. Oh, well, I hope to be back with you, Laura, as this goes on. Thank much you for welcome. putting Have this a great together. one. Okay. Bye-bye.